very much, Hugh. Um, the <coughs> next two papers in this session, uh, as, you, as is obvious, move towards Welsh. I, I, I know Mordred will probably say um, something as well, but if I just sort of make the point here that in all Fergus's uh, marvellous work on early Irish law, uh, there is much to interest those on the other side of the Irish Sea. Um, one only needs to sort of look through the index of early Irish farming to see how useful it is for um, Welsh as well. Um, I want to talk about a particular aspect of, of Welsh law, which in a sense is one of those bits where there's a significant difference with, from what we have in Irish. Namely, what we find in Welsh law is the fact that we frequently encounter um, in these uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century manuscripts the same law in different languages. That same law expressed both in Welsh and also in Latin. In, very often in different manuscripts, but in some instances, for example, Latin D, uh, both in Latin and in Welsh, actually within the same text. Um, I'm particularly, therefore, interested today in these Latin texts, um, and I've put that quotation from Clifford Collan at the top there, um, which just sort of, actually, I leave it there for sort of reflection, really, because um, it just is a very interesting, if there's any doubt, go to the Latin ones. Um, and I just, I mean, it just makes me think, and actually, I think this is often the case, that in some ways, the textual tradition of the Latin versions of these laws tends to be somewhat more stable than the, uh, uh, the Welsh text. That's particularly the case probably in Blake Urid and sort of Covenath type redactions of Welsh law, where there is a sort of significant instability in those Welsh texts. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about primarily are the Latin redactions to begin with. Um, and our number one on the handout is just really setting out some of the details. There's a slight, perhaps a slightly clearer version on the back of uh, Morphy's handout, in fact, if, you, if, you, if you've got that in front of you as well, which you do have. Um, the point being that you have these five redactions... Um, I've given you the earliest manuscript of each one. The num plus number at the end is the other later versions of that same redaction that, is around, that are around as well. Almost in all, virtually every case, slightly more confused for Latin E, but virtually in every case, uh, those are dependent on this, the, 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 the medieval manuscript. Um, in addition, we have the vernacular redactions, which I put in B there, but I'm not particularly going to talk about those, only so for, insofar as we will return to the Blaguri redaction, because uh, for my purposes, this is particularly interesting because the Blaguri redaction is a translation. We know it is a translation. Uh, Howell Emanuel demonstrated this in um, uh, uh, the, an article on the bibliography was at the end there. Um, in addition to his editions of the, the Latin laws, there's a separate article where he's talking about the, uh, the evidence for Latin, uh, Blaguri redaction being a translation of, of something close to Latin D. It's not Latin, dependent on Latin D, but some, a text that is close to Latin D. Um, what I'm particularly interested in today is in asking a question to which I'm not going to provide an answer, but the question is there. What I'm interested in is whether in any given archetype or uh, tractate can we tell whether that was written in Latin or in Welsh. Um, and how far back can we think about this? And what I really want to do today is offer you some sort of reflections about this, really, um, and not so much whether to provide a yes or no answer in any particular case, um, although it's pretty clear that's what's going on. We know, we know what's going on with Latin D and, and the relationship between Latin D and Blegurid. Um, but how we might be able to tell what kind of evidence might help us in those kinds of reflections. Um, we might pause and just think about these Latin texts. Um, these are very different types of texts. Those of you who've um, uh, you know, encountered some of these Latin texts of the Welsh laws, Latin B is a very composite text. It shows the joins. It's a, 
It's, it's uh, mid-13th century, but it is already a compiled text. It is an antiquarian collection that's gathering all kinds of material that's more or less related to, to, to Welsh law as well as the, sort of the core text. Um, both Latin E are significantly tidier, and they are derived at various points from something like earlier versions of Latin B. So there's a relationship between those. E, the Latin E version being actually significantly later. As I said, Blegurid's translation of a text close to Latin D. Latin C, I shall come back to in a minute. Um, potentially, the core of Latin B is, is actually one of the most interesting bits of all of these texts, um, partly because it does seem to contain some really quite old material. Um, one of the questions that arises with all of this is whether we are to think of these Latin texts as being, these different redactions, as being textually related as a body of Latin texts, or whether we are to see them as being more subtly and more complicatedly related and interrelated to these Welsh texts. And I'm inclined to think of the latter in some instances. Um, and certainly one can see how Latin A and Latin A, uh, A, E and B are related. Latin C is, and Latin D are slightly more problematic in terms of thinking them in terms of clear-cut sort of relationships. And I think one also has to be aware of the fact that as, as has become increasingly obvious, it is important not necessarily to think of these texts in terms of texts as whole texts, but rather to think of a series of tractates on different topics. And very often the textual relationships of the uh, different tractates will be rather different one from the other, even though they sit side by side in the same text. Okay? So what I'm interested in uh, is essentially, therefore, what indications we have of whether a particular version of these, uh, these laws is written in Latin or in Welsh. Um, what might we be looking for? Okay. And what I'm going to do here is uh, consider three examples moving back in time, um, but also increasing in complexity in terms of the examples. Um, there's plenty other bits of material I could talk about in, uh, with regard to this, but I'm going to sort of just give you sort of three sort of aspects of this. The first two relate to these Welsh laws, and then the third one. Um, is I'm going back to the privilege of Taylor, Brank Taylor, uh, in the Book of Llandar. Um First example, just so this is a bit of a warm-up, this one, because it's sort of fairly straightforward to see what's going on here, is the kind of example that I've given you in one there, where we have a, a textual error in the Latin D. Blegura tradition, but it's a textual error that seems highly unlikely to have happened in Welsh, but almost certainly to have happened in Latin, namely the confused textual error of vox and vix, uh, voice and scarcely. Um, this is, comes from the, the bit about the, the nodai, the, the sort of the, the, the protections, oh, and this is the, the, the refugium of the Penkanid, the chief huntsman, is to give safe conduct to a person Quo vox cornu eius auditor. So, so as far as the sort of the sound of his horn can be heard, more or less along that kind of sense. Um, slightly odd in some of the other the Latin versions, uh, and also in Latin D and in Blegurid, uh, you have in the Latin ones vix, and then brave. That's a translation of vix in Blegurid. Um, as far as his horn can scarcely be heard, doesn't actually seem to have quite the precision one might would hope for with this kind of sort of giving safe conduct for a particular um, distance. Um, and very often these um, these 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 nodai, these protections have to do either with space, it's a distance, and particularly with the officers of the court who uh, are out and about, as it were, it tends to be to do with spatial sort of dimensions of their protection. Uh, with the officers within the court itself, it tends to be, as it were, the length of their working day or whatever. So it's, it's from when they start doing their job until they stop doing their job. So it tends to be sort of 
temporal rather than, than spatial. Anyway, there we have an example of uh, uh, a variation in the text where you can see, and we know this anyway, and this is only one of the little examples that, to show that um, Blegurid is derived from Latin D, but it's a nice example of the kind of thing one ought to be looking for in terms of uh, the, the, the language of the, 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 the sort of base text lying behind this. So the, the sort of the Vox Vix thing. I don't think necessarily that this tells us particularly anything about any particular relationship between Latin A and Latin C and Latin D because um, what is also, of course, the point is that with the Vix Vox one, this is not going to be, that's a very easy error to make. So one could see it happening sort of several times over. Um, my second example is um, Latin C, which is the one I sort of declined to tell you about just now. Um, this is a very small manuscript, British Library, uh, 1796. This one's from Anglesey, um, uh, around the middle of the 13th century in terms of date. It, I've, I've uh, recently produced a new edition of this one, um, and... This is an extremely interesting text because it's in Latin, but it has a lot of embedded and glossing Welsh legal vocabulary as well. Um, and the Latin, so that you get Latin terminology glossed in Welsh and the Welsh vocabulary, technical terminology embedded in the Latin, glossed in Latin. Okay, so it's actually effectively bilingual in terms of, uh, of the way it's structured. Um, and what is quite interesting is that the, the Latin glossing in some of this looks as if it's a bit later. Um, the, it's, it's a very, the Latin of it is much more sort of Anglo-Norman type of Latin. Um, for example, sort of the guas, guesion, the lads, as it were, are uh, glossed garciones. We can work out where that comes from. Um, and um, that's actually very different from the Latin of the main text. What is interesting about this in terms of this is, and this is where I'm thinking in terms of going back in time, is that this text comes from Anglesey. You would therefore reasonably, and indeed it is the case, much of this text has quite a close relationship to, in terms of content to the Yorweth redaction from Gwyneth. But... What it doesn't do is show you the structure of a text that is distinctively a Yorworth redaction text. Um, as some of you may know, uh, David Jenkins uh, argued um, rightly, I think, that uh, in around 1240 or so, the Yorworth redaction was created by Yorworth at Mad Dog by rearranging the text of the kind of text one could find one sees in a Covenant redaction, and essentially creating what's known as a test book, in other words, the judge's book, Shiva Prauv, by pulling material out of the main text and putting it to the end into this, the, the, the sort of the judge's handbook, if you, if you like. Now, uh, Latin C, although it is of this period and from Angle C, uh, there's a particular section that, on the Mechten Dalied, um, which is actually not in the test book, which is where it is. There is the end of Latin C is broken. We don't know whether there was any kind of test book on the end. That bit of text is not in. That, it's back in the early part of the text where you would normally find it in a normal non yorwes type of structure. Okay? So in other words, this is a text that looks as if it's a North Walian text, but it hasn't undergone the Yorwes type of rearrangement of the text. In other words, suggesting that it, perhaps on Anglesey they were a little bit behind what was going on in Gwynedd, or alternatively it is, does actually just ref simply reflecting a North Walian version pre yorweth And if it is doing that, it's actually really quite an important text to, to be able to think about in those types of t ways. Um, when I was reworking and going through and, and editing this text, one of the things that struck me about this text is it does show a number of features which crop up in other Latin texts occasionally, but nowhere near as often, um, features that, to my mind, smell um, quite Welsh. In other words, it's a Latin text. But, for example, uh, typically in the offices of the court, when one's talking about the notion of entitlement, um, 
the Latin texts talk about ex debet habere, is entitled to receive, ought to have, etc., etc. Um, typically in this text, and occasionally in Latin, some of the parts of Latin B, it's just debet. There is no habere. Um, if you go to, I should, a little health warning here, if you go to Emmanuel's text, you will find debet habere all the way through Latin C. He's put the habere back in most of the time. You can tell from the apparatus that he's doing it, but it's really misleading. Um, so it does very much look here as if one's got a, 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 a Latin usage which has that sort of uh, Welsh feel about it. In other words, debet is very much corresponding to the way dilly is used in a, in a Welsh text. Um, Another thing that I have been struck by in this text, and again it's the same kind of thing that appears in some of the other texts but seems to be, as it were, uh, edited out by copiers, um, is the fact that you find third singular passive verbs being used as if they were impersonal. Okay? So I give you an example. And these examples are sort of of, to my mind, of increasing reliability, the order I've given you. The first one there, the quad corium datur antiquam dividatur coria. All right? Um, the, and antiquam dividatur coria, um, before the hides, it looks as if it should mean before the hides are split up, divided uh, between the, the officers. But the verb is dividatur, not dividantur. Uh, later on in the same text you do find dividantur and one might reasonably think, ooh, suspension mark gone astray here, um, not, not too much of a problem. And I d wouldn't think of it as being, as it were, uh, particularly of being a third singular sort of impersonal usage of a verb, except that there are other examples of it in this text which are less easy to explain by, as it were, a stray suspension mark. Um, another, uh, another one here, debet haber, uh, uh, tertiam partem diri eius, so he's entitled to have a third part of, um, uh, of, his, uh, of, the, of the fine. Cium tenetur. All right? Um, so if there is an arresting of him, it seems to be what this means. Okay. With that tenetur. Elsewhere you find, and indeed in this text, you'll find tenu erit. One might again argue someone's scrambling their abbreviations for URs and ERs and everything else here. Um, it's less clear that that is going on in this case. Well, you might want to argue it for the dividantur. But it does look as if they are thinking in terms of using these Latin verbs as, as if they are impersonal. The last example that seems to be much, much harder to sort of argue away is the ne disturbetur aule, with an E on the end. Um, you might want to argue that that is actually for aula, but this is what the manuscript has, and it's perfectly clear um, you know, that there is not a disturbance, as it were, in the hall, for the hall, or for the people in the hall. And so this is about the, 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 the poet playing the music too loudly up in the Queen's quarters. Um, and... Um, it very much seems to pattern with what we find in the Covenant redaction in the Welsh, Shrag Tervaski, Ashis, or Anineyath, right? Uh, you know, to stop them, Tervaski, causing Tervis, causing sort of disruption in the, in the court or in the hall. So there's this series of examples where you start seeing one and you think, oh, that's an error. You start seeing two or three, and you think, oh, maybe it's not an error. And then you begin to see there's a pattern to this. And it does seem to me you've got sort of a rather nice example of where it looks as if, you know, the point about Latin is that there are some verbs in Latin that you can use in personally like this, but they're a minute handful. Um, but it looks as if it's sort of an extending that possibly under the influence of, of, of Welsh. Um, a final example here, which... Um, strikes me also is that has, has struck me in this text is a number of instances of where in is using, used in that kind of predicative way that Welsh un is used. Uh, so in kibos and kipitrum as food for the hawks, in mercade as, as her maiden fee it's not an in this looks much more like the, the, the sort of predicative but carried across into Latin. Um, 
What makes me think there's something interesting going on here as much as anything else is that when one tracks the same bit of text through the other uh, Latin uh, texts, these things are gradually erased. All right, these sort of particular types of expression. In other words, these do look as if these are the sort of the harder readings, as it were, the lectiones difficiliores. Um, and that actually sort of seems to me to be significant in thinking about this. Um, so is this indication, therefore, perhaps of a Latin text that has been translated? Or, and this is, of course, the... The, the, the other possibility, or while what is what we are seeing here, the development of, as it were, a Welsh Latin, Cambro Latin legal usage. In other words, the, the Latin is being influenced by Welsh, but we're not seeing necessarily, we, don't need, we can't necessarily assume translation. That's certainly the kind of thing one sees the other way around, for example, that the style of the Welsh in well-known translation texts in Welsh does have a Latinate feel about it. So, um, and it's hardly surprising when, you know, when Brita Brenhines is translated from Geoffrey that you're going to get some sort of Latinate usage in that type of Welsh. But then you get a text like Cavranchi Vashabellis, which is this little narrative that is plugged into the Welsh versions of Geoffrey in the, in the Britie, but doesn't correspond to anything in Geoffrey. But this, again, has this same kind of Latinate type of Welsh. And there's other instances of this where you can almost see Braidwood Maxen, for example, has features that make it look and feel more Latinate. And these are things... Uh, Bryn Roberts, in his introduction to Cleveland Tabellis, is incredibly rude about this particular sort of style of being flat and boring, etc., etc., etc. It's a different style. Um, but things like Brave with Maxim and Cabranchi de Helves have this kind of thing of, of having a much more subordinating type of structure where you have lots of pan when clauses with, with uh, you know, subordinate clauses following them and so on and so forth, much more than you would ever find statistically than you would ever find in normal sort of native Welsh prose. So in other words, there is evidence there for a development of a sort of Welsh style that is influenced by the starting point being translation text. But it develops into a style beyond just simply translation. So turn this around the other way. Is it the case in something like Latin C that what we're seeing is the development of a sort of a, a Cambro Latin, features of sort of a Cambro Latin, which are um, you know, influenced by Welsh, but not necessarily evidence for translation. Okay, so that's sort of two examples. The third one is, which is what I want to spend the rest of the time on, is Brank Taylor, the privilege of Taylor. Um, and this is where... Um, let me just offer you a few pictures just to sort of distract you from me. Um, uh, there is a single leaf, folio 63, in the Book of Landav, which contains both a Latin and an Old Welsh, late Old Welsh, allegedly, uh, text of the privilege of Taylor. All right? It is a single leaf. Um, now, I've got to be careful here. Last time I did this, I fell off the edge. There's the Latin, there, privilegium, uh, sancti filiadi at the top there, um, and uh, this is the, the recto. You've then got the statutum est bit there. Then you've got flimmer gebreit abriae neglus teiau. So that's where the Welsh one, the Welsh goes to there. This then was added at the end, which is a, a little bull of uh, excommunication written in there in 1410. We know that because there's a date in there. Um, you will find these texts on the latter part of your handout. If you go to the latter part of the handout, you will see that um, what I give you is there's transcriptions of both of those. Um, and you will then follow that, following on the end there, is 
from Wendy Davis's edition of Bryant Taylor. You'll see her text and translation there. Her text is thoroughly confusing because what she has done is printed the Latin and the Welsh line by line in parallel. That's not what's in the text. That's the text. You've got your Latin and then you've got your Welsh. Okay? Um, what I want to do is talk about this because I've sort of um, increasingly found myself with a problem with this text. Namely, every time I go and look at it, I stop believing what anybody says about it. Um, and so this is very much work beginning of this, really, because I think there's a lot to be done with this. And I don't think we have really quite understood what's going on. Um, and so this is just really a sort of a review and a preliminary sort of presentation of some of the problems I am finding with this text. Okay? Um, crucially, the first thing, and there's lots of things that people sort of have, uh, are there in the scholarship, but actually no one really takes on board when you're thinking about this, the privilege of Taylor. Firstly, this is a single leaf. It is written by what Daniel Hughes calls Scribe A of the manuscript, so it's the same scribe as a good chunk of, right, of, of the Book of Handav. This is, however, an inserted leaf. All right? It's been pushed into a choir. Um, so it's a single leaf. Um, and it's self-contained. It comes after the life of Taylor, but before a series of charters, but it is a, a, an add-in. All right? And that's actually really, I think, quite important and significant. Um, Wendy Davies uh, has, um, in um, and the bibliography is on page three of the handout there, um, in, uh, 19, sort of in the mid-1970s, Wendy Davies produced what has been the absolute standard go-to piece of work article on this, including that edition and translation, which is at the end of the, uh, the handout. She argued at that point that Bright Taylor, the Welsh, and BT is Bright Taylor in my handout, i.e. The, the Welsh version, PT in any of this is the, the Latin version, Privilegium. Um, she argued that the, the, the Welsh version fell into two parts. The first part being later than the second bit. So if you heard a part one, the dates are on the handout there, uh, and part two being uh, sort of 950 to, to 1090, part one being 1110 to 1129, so just up close to when uh, the Book of Llandab itself is being copied. Um, she makes this very striking observation um, that... Uh, I've sort of read several times and never thought very hard about it, then come back to it again and find it even more striking. It is quite clear that Latin, Latin is a rendering of the Welsh version and not vice versa. Um, given the kind of period we're talking about, actually that's quite striking. And I think at the time in the 70s, nowhere near enough work had been done at that point on the relationship between sort of Latin versions and Welsh versions of text and so on and so forth. But this, for this particular period strikes me as being significant because we would really expect that to be the other way around, probably. We would expect, in most cases, the, the Welsh versions to be derived from, from a Latin version, I think. Um, there's a whole series of other problems with this old Welsh text, which is never, ever really clear for, as it were, sort of standard scholarly users of this text. Um, the Old Welsh text is heavily worked over and has been, there's bits of erasure here, um, bits being added uh, all the way through this. And in fact, the next slide makes the Welsh one a bit bigger. And it's actually not very easy to see even here. But it almost certainly, when this was written in 1410, this had an editing. So it's really quite an interesting series of what someone in 1410 would do with a chunk of Old Welsh. And that's, I'm not going to particularly talk about that. At an earlier stage, there has been erasures uh, and bits wiped out. Typically, what you get as the standard sort of working edition of the text is a text that goes back to something as close to the underlying text, not the text that's on the, in the manuscript. All right, so what you've got, for example, in Wendy's text there is something that is 
uh, pretty sort of already well edited and worked over. Um, as soon as you go back and look at this in any detail, all kinds of problems bubble up with the old Welsh in this. Um, and in fact, I sort of, uh, I've written a bit about this in one of my things on orthography in terms of the whys and things. And I've realized since then that I got that completely and utterly wrong. All right? Um, and actually one needs to go back and look at this again. Because in fact, I was equally well misled by the, the normal presentation of this text. One of the particular things about this text, the closer I look at it, it is a copied text. And it's clearly what's going on in some of this. There are scribal errors in it. For example, there's uh, in a couple of instances, there's N, Y, Ni, when actually you should be expecting N, Y, N. All right? Almost certainly that's the kind of error that typically crops up when the original has got I, N, and you've got three minims, and they then read that the wrong way around. Okay? What is clearly the case is this text has been over-wide. In other words, in some one of its later copies, someone is modernizing the orthography and putting in more Y. And in fact, putting in too much Y. There are Ys around where uh, there's a... Um, uh, over here... There's uh, Angadarnedic, um, yeah, um, where this is Kadar, and you should not have a Y at the front of Kadar, and it's not, it's not Kadarnedic, it's Angadarnedic, strengthened, confirmed. Someone is over Ying this, yet one of the main points in terms of the orthography, of the points that Wendy Davies makes about splitting the second half, making that earlier, is that there's more I and less Y in the second bit and more Y in the first bit. But this text has been edited and over wide all the way through. So actually, you suddenly, part of the reason for splitting this into two bits begins to disappear. All right, so there's all kinds of things we need to do about this. Anyway, what I want to do is just think about this in terms of the logic of which way around the translation is going here. Um, Wendy Davies' main reasons are what I've given. The WD is Wendy here, Wendy Davies. C, uh, section C, example three, section C. The main, her main reasons for thinking the Latin was translated um, from the Welsh are those there. The tendency for the Latin to be shorter, omissions in the Latin in relation to the Welsh, um, and there's a particular phrase using chrith chrag brenin, Afrag Paub versus Libera Pro Rega, and she builds quite a lot on that. And then the fact that in the Welsh you have Kevraith, but you have lots of terminology for legal terms in the Latin. Those are, and I can already see a few question marks coming above heads here, because she, some of this is the wrong way round in terms of the logic of an argument. Um, I think all of these can be turned around the other way. Um, the, t the fact that the, the, uh, the, 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 the Latin is shorter and the Welsh is longer, in other words, the Latin is, according to Wendy, abbreviating. But there is throughout this Welsh, a te uh, Welsh text a tendency to generate rhetorical doublets. All right? So once you allow for the fact that Wel the Welsh text is constantly talking about tir a diar, as it were, land and soil, if you like, or something like that. Um, Aigur aiguas, all right? Sort of men and, men and boy, but actually what it's meaning is meaning actually basically everybody male, really, I think is what it's what's mean by that. And that throughout this, you're getting this inside X, outside X. And what they mean by inside, inside a place, in the fan and outside the fan is basically everywhere. Okay? And there is this building up of these rhetorical doublets. Um, and it seems to me, therefore, you can actually argue for a sort of a generation of sort of the rhetoric within the Welsh that doesn't necessarily follow that, as it were, the Latin is coming from the Welsh, but as it were, the Welsh may well be coming from some form of the Latin. There's some of those in the Latin of these rhetorical doublets, and that's what seems to me to be striking. There's some but not very many, and it seems to me quite likely that where there is a model within the Latin for creating the rhetorical doublets and 
the Welsh text is sort of working this and, and as a sort of rhetorical device. Um, the, uh, what Wendy t talks about in terms of omissions in the Latin, um, in other words, they've, they've skipped, what she's doing is saying, well, they've just skipped that particular phrase in translating in the Latin. But actually, in most cases, what actually these phrases are, are technical Welsh legal terminology. All right? So, just as easily it is possible, and I think quite likely, that what is happening in the Welsh is this text is being developed in a very specifically Welsh legal way by the working in of the, the Welsh terminology. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, the particularly telling one, I think, is number four, um, the fact that the Welsh just simply uses cyfraith all the way through, but you get legibus justitia rectum lex all the way through in variously in the privilegium, is very striking. You really do expect the complex, varied terminology to be in the base text and a translation to reduce that range of terminology, it seems to me. Um, uh, the Amga Darnedig that I've given you in, in number five, again, is striking because these edig types of participles are very, very common when Welsh is being, uh, Latin is being translated into Welsh. All right, because it standardly is what translates past participles. Um, and it's very commonly in British Brenhinia that you have lots and lots of edig, and you really don't find edig in that kind of way in, in, in sort of native Welsh prose. Okay, so the other point also to make, and this is D here, is that in addition to the Privilegium Taylor, um, uh, the one on the left there. There are the two other privileges. There's a privilege of a dogwi and a privilege of Dovrig as well, which are significantly less elaborate than this privilegium here. Um, and I just want to sort of hold that thought for the moment because actually John Reuben Davies in, one, in his uh, recent discussion of the privilegium, um, and I'm quoting here, um, talks of the, the privilegium Taylor as saying, rather clumsily got up to look like a papal bull um, uh, tacked onto the end as a deposition and a sanction clauses which have been lifted verbatim from a solemn papal privilege. In other words, this one and, and John's view of this privilege in Taylor, without thinking about his relation to the Latin, because he's not interested in that particularly, is, so in relation to the Welsh, this is a got up document anyway. In other words, it's been put together from other things. If you go and look at the um, other, other, other privileges, they are significantly less elaborate than this one. So, pulling this together, what am I thinking is going on here? Well, my preliminary thoughts on this is that something like the Privilegium Taylor, Taylorvi, is the base text, which was translated into Welsh. In other words, it's that way around, not the way Wendy uh, has argued it. I'm not convinced that Privilegium Taylor is the base text. I don't think it is. Uh, because this is, looks as if it's already been made much more elaborate. I, my preliminary hypothesis for this is at the moment is that there was an earlier version of the Privilegium Taylor which was much closer to the types of privileges of Dabrig and Eidogwy. Um, and it is that that gets translated into Welsh. Um, it is certainly the case that the, the bright tale does, the Welsh version does fall into two parts. I mean, Wendy is right in terms of content, there are two parts to it. Whether they are chronologically distinct, I'm not sure. I think they might not be. But it does look as if someone has worked this material to make a, provide a much more Glamorgan fo focus to, to the last part of this. Um, as I said, that all on, the, on Brian Taylor is, is very sort of preliminary and it's just sort of, sort of just this is really sort of, um, I'm deeply unhappy about this text, is really what I'm wanting to, 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 to register. But it's an interesting example because here we have Latin and Welsh sitting side by side. All right? It's doing similar things, they sit side by side in the manuscript. And remember that we are talking about something that may well be as early as the late 10th century or the earlier 11th century. And that actually gets us back a long way back into earlier Welsh law 
where we have these things sitting side by side. If I'm right that the Latin is the base text and the Welsh is a translation, then we are, that actually telling us something about the relationship of Latin and Welsh at that early as well. And I shall stop there. Thank you.